Um, so I actually emailed uh, Jeremy about four weeks ago, and um, I saw um, that, creative, that Melbourne has a creative morning, and I said, um, you know, I offered myself to actually speak here. And four weeks ago, the theme was maker, and I thought, you know, once in my life I've actually made something that lives in the real world, and I'm not embarrassed to show. And I emailed him and said, oh, I'm happy to talk. And he said, oh, well, we already have a speaker for, for that month's theme, and um, would you like to speak the next month? And I said, yeah, sure. And then he told me um, that uh, a few weeks later that the theme is Rebel. And I thought, yes. <laughs> what I really thought was, the most introverted guy in the room will tell you how to be a rebel. Because um, most of the time, I'm my own biggest critic and I'm riddled with self-doubt <laughs> and so um, I'm probably the least qualified person to uh, talk about being a rebel. But um, when I was looking through the photos through my archive to send a photo to Jeremy for the website, I actually found this thing <laughs> and I thought maybe there's more of a punk in me than I remember. So <clears throat> um, I'm originally from, from Germany, um, my name is Kai. And um, I've been in Australia for uh, almost 12 years now, with a few breaks. And um, I've been playing with computers for about 16 years or so. And um, the last 10 of these years, I've been designing websites and UI and UX uh, professionally as a, as a freelancer for companies in Australia and the US and in Germany. And mid-2011, I think, um, I was sitting in front of my computer. I was looking at um, a folder that looked like this, and I realized that Everything that I've produced in the last, um, you know, five, ten years, um, I could delete, delete um, through the click of a button, basically. And I uh, really started to wonder or think about the, the topic of legacy and, you know, what legacy means in the digital age. Because everything that we produce as digital designers or digital creators um, disappears into the ether that is the internet after a while, right? Everything we produce lives as long as the next release cycle, the next trend or acquisition. And so this, this, to this topic of, of um, legacy really bothered me all of a sudden. I really didn't know whether I was leaving anything behind after so many years of, of making things. And so I decided to actually take a break, and I uh, went traveling for a bit. I went um, to New York and Tokyo and Berlin and, and Mexico and tried to catch up with as many people as I could that I knew through Twitter and Facebook. So all the people that I've been following and the work that I admired, I tried to um, you know, basically sit down with them for a beer or a coffee and sort of talk to them about the issues that I just told you about, like the legacy, but also um, you know, just to get an idea of who they are, what's happening behind the scene of the websites and the apps that I've been using for a long time. And I realized that there's a lot of stories happening behind these digital interfaces that we use every day. And a lot of times, you know, we, we, we spend time on Twitter and Facebook talking about um, um, these, these products or, you know, ranting sometimes, talking negatively, criti criticizing people for what they produce without actually knowing that there's something very human happening in the background. And so I started, by traveling around, I started this humanization process um, that left me sort of inspired and longing for more. And uh, when I wasn't catching up with people, I actually spent a lot of times in bookshops. Um, I always really liked the physicality of magazines and, and, and real books, especially as someone that has been working in web design and, and, and digital for all of his life. The idea of um, producing something that you know, lives on forever is something that always fascinated me a bit. And um, there's also something about the craftsmanship and the the finality of a magazine or a printed, publi a printed publication that I really admire. Um, there's a guy who can say this much better than me. His name is Peter Ramian, and he says, uh, a magazine asks you to pause for a moment, smell it, touch it, examine it, and think about it. It offers a nuanced activism that resists the non-stop anxieties of everyday life. The non-stop anxieties of everyday life. Does that sound familiar to all of us? 
So I came home, I unpacked my bags, I had a stack of magazines that I bought while I was traveling, and I went through the magazines, and I realized that I really wanted to make something um, for the physical world, something that existed beyond today and tomorrow, something that I could put on my shelf at home or give to my, my friends and family and say, <coughs> and say I've made this. Um, and I wanted to combine my admiration for, for print and for the printed, mag uh, printed uh, publication and my love and passion for, for web and digital into a magazine, and I wanted to call it Offscreen. The mission was pretty basic. I wanted to put the face back into interface. I wanted to give the digital world a human touch. And at the same time, I hoped that uh, a beautifully produced magazine would um, encourage people to put their iPad down and actually enjoy uh, a long-term, a long-form piece of writing uh, about their colleagues um, in a more um, distraction-free and multi-sensory experience. And so I started just doing some research. I went online, I went on Google and on Facebook and ordered a few, um, a few publications about indie, publica uh, indie publishing. Um, read the books in a couple of days and wasn't really much wiser. Everything was pretty outdated that I, that I found online as well. And so I went through the stack of magazines I had at home sitting on my desk um, and contacted some of the publishers and the, and the editors of these magazines and uh, those that got back to me actually um, said pretty much the same thing. You know, they, they told me that you need a trustworthy team of publishers, I mean, of editors, of, of uh, writers, authors, photographers, designers, uh, marketing folks to actually sell the magazine and get uh, advertising into the magazine. And they basically all said the same thing. You know, it's a lot of work, um, insane deadlines, and the money is really shit. <clears throat> and there I was, you know, trying to make a magazine. English isn't even my first language. Um, but I, there was something that I, I just couldn't let go, and I, I started to crunch some numbers and um, sent emails to printers in, in Australia, and mostly Australia at that time. Um, and the quotes I got back sort of was a bit of was a bit of a disappointment because I realised that printing actually is really expensive. You know, something I didn't really understand coming from digital, where you know you produce something, your own time is whatever you put in, nothing else is needed most of the time, and so. <clears throat> um, then I thought, you know, I'm from Germany, and uh, German people know a thing or two about the printing press. And so I contacted uh, printers in Germany, in Berlin, and uh, asked them for a quote. And I was surprised to hear that, uh, you know, the, the prices there are much, much more affordable. And uh, I, was, I was really lucky to find a printer that was also open to my newbie questions, because I didn't know anything about print. And so that would actually help me um, understand um, the concept, uh, what sort of things actually go into a quote. Um, and uh, <clears throat> proved to be a really good fit. And as you do these days, you have an idea, and you need money for it, so you throw it in Kickstarter. And this is um, two and a half years ago or so. Um, so I don't know if you can see it over there, but um, I had a funding goal of $16,000, uh, which I didn't reach. Um, I actually didn't succeed. There's a, a lot of things I can um, talk about when it comes to Kickstarter. I love Kickstarter. Kickstarter is awesome. But um, when it comes to, especially magazines and new publications, it's really hard to actually um, sell the idea on Kickstarter because you have nothing to show for. Um, and one of the reasons I didn't succeed was, I think, self-inflicted. Um, when I got up to about um, ten, twelve thousand dollars, or yeah, ten thousand dollars in about a week before the funding goal ended, I um, I realized that I had I could possibly make the the money, the goal that I set up set out. But the problem was that I only had about two hundred backers at that time. And if you know anything about print, you know that in order to get a really low per issue price on a magazine or any publication, you really need to print um, you know, a few thousand or a higher amount. And so my quotes were based on at least you know, 2,000 or so copies. And if I, had, if I get the money to print the thing, I only have 200 readers or 300 readers, that wouldn't really make a sustainable magazine. And so I locked down some of the higher pledge tiers. I, I tried to get people to give me um, less money, but more people giving me money so that I could actually make my funding goal with more backers. That didn't go so well. So um, that was probably one of, one of the problems uh, I, I caused myself. Uh, but you know what? Once the funding period was, uh, was over and I didn't reach my funding goal, I was a bit disappointed, but at the same time, I realized that it gave me a chance to re rethink my concept and regroup and, and, and think about what I really wanted to produce. And as you can see, it looks much different on the, uh, on the video there than the, the final magazine. So it actually gave me a chance to uh, um, yeah, rethink the, the whole concept of the magazine. And so now I decided to go ahead with my own money um, because I had gotten that far. And so um, 
I now want to take you guys through a few simple steps um, of uh, what I did after that and how I put together the first issue. Obviously, content is the, the, the most important element of any publication, and uh, I luckily had a, a large network of friends and colleagues to fall back on through Twitter and Facebook. So um, once I decided that I wanted to make a magazine, I actually got in touch with all the people that I knew that I wanted to have in a magazine, uh, emailed them and asked them, you know, would you be interested in either doing an interview with me or writing a small piece? Um, there was lots of different types of features in the magazine, so I found, uh, after a few weeks, I found a lot of people that are, were interested enough to actually help me get this done. Um, I also decided at that point that every, every issue would have six lengthy intimate interviews at the core of, of the magazine. Um, that would be something that would you know, run through every single issue from then. Um, this is still the most important and most difficult part of, of making a magazine, getting contributors to confirm and actually um, get you what you want, when you want it. Um, that's still the biggest struggle. Um, especially since I'm only a one-person um, magazine. And so the next thing I did was basically set up a content plan. And the content plan is something that you see sometimes in photos for bigger magazines like Vogue. They have a big wall and they have all these, um, these printouts where they shuffle around content and they put things in certain spots. And, but I didn't have a big wall, so I actually put it in a, in a Google document. And so it's pretty simple. It's a it's a it's a spreadsheet, and you can see the numbers on this, the, the the numbers in the first column. There's the page numbers, and then you can see the the actual feature, um, the name of the contributor, and um, some boxes to tick off when stuff's coming in. And that was you know issue number one. It's a bit a little bit more sophisticated now, but it's pretty much a similar concept. And then for every contributor that I worked with, I actually created more Google Docs. So I love Google Docs, as you can see. It's actually a great tool to collaborate with people. Um, so I created Google Documents for every single person I worked with. I gave them instructions about what they needed to do and what I want from them. And then they actually com um, completed their contribution in that document and we could work on it and edit it together. It works really well. <coughs> and um, yeah, so at the end of that process, I would actually take all the content that um, would exist in all these different Google Documents and put them into one master document. Um, that's probably about 40 or 45,000 words, and I would work with my proofreader that I would hire on a freelance basis um, to go through all the text and make sure that there's no typos and that there's a consistent flow of things. Um, the next stage would be the layout stage, and as a web designer who lived in Photoshop land and HTML ed editors for all of his life, um, I realized quickly that I had no idea how to use InDesign. Um, and so I went to a website called lynda.com, which is uh, pretty awesome. Um, it's basically a website where you can learn software tools and, 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 and certain processes by uh, just watching videos. And I spent about two weeks or so just watching every, every video they had on, on InDesign typography, uh, pre-press process, color management, and so on. And during that time, I actually really, um, I, I actually realized how much depth there is to typography, and I think the, the idea of typography as a web designer, especially when you started, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, doesn't really exist online. Like, when I started with web, doing web design, we had like five, six typefaces to choose from. Um, there was no freedom at all in, in setting, like, laying out type. Um, and so, doing this, this research and actually learning more about InDesign and how to use InDesign opened up this massive field uh, of typography and, and, and you know, typesetting to me, it was amazing. Um, and just to give you an example, like, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of print designers here that know exactly what I'm talking about, but as a web designer, um, the, the idea of having to buy a, a license, a font license, and then to test, to test a font, you have to buy a license, you install it on your computer, you throw some text at it in InDesign, you print out the, the, the page, and then you finally see whether it works, whether it's something that you like. And you repeat that process, rinse, repeat, uh, every time you want to do adjustments. So you, know, you adjust the letting, you adjust the font size, you adjust the column width, the margins. And uh, you do that so many times until you're happy with something. You know, as a web designer, you press a couple of buttons and it's done. So that was, uh, that was a pretty interesting process for me. From the get-go, I knew that um, the cover price alone wouldn't really cover um, all the expenses, or they probably would cover the expenses, but I wouldn't really be able to sustain a magazine. So um, the idea of advertising was always on the, uh, on the plate, and I, I didn't really like ads. I mean, there's some ads, there's some magazines like Vogue and Monocle where the ads are actually not that bad. They're actually quite high, high quality, and they look good at least. 
even though they're quite annoying because they now make up you know, sometimes 30 or 40% of the magazine. Um, but with independent magazines, with smaller ma magazines, the problem with advertising is that a lot of times um, the, the companies you work with, the advertisers, have little or no money to actually produce good quality ads. And um, you end up with really shitty, bad-looking ads that disrupt the, your magazine, you know, especially as a designer who pays a lot of attention to making the magazine look good. You don't want some shitty ad to ruin the experience. And so I came up with a concept of sponsorships in a magazine that um, eventually led to, to this thing. So um, there's eight sponsors in the middle of a magazine, in the center of the magazine. They're all um, presented in a unified, very um, non-intrusive way. And um, to my surprise, I actually got a lot of feedback um, back from my readers, especially after the first two, two or so issues. And everyone seemed to really notice and, and, and enjoy the way I, I executed this, this advertising concept. And I find it really interesting because um, this sort of proves that you can make something really subtle and the opposite of in your face, but you actually get more attention um, from it. Um, people pay more attention to it. And uh, I really like that idea that you can make something subtle. And we just had a talk about um, something similar, like when you come here and you actually hear who's involved in making this event, that's, um, you know, you don't need to have, have it in your face everywhere. It's just a subtle way of, of, of including uh, sponsorships or including companies. And that's exactly what I'm doing with the magazine, and it works really well. And so after four or five months of working on the first issue, uh, I finally was at this point that I uh, could uh, take all the stuff that was in InDesign and export it, export it into this gigantic PDF file, which as a web designer was a bizarre concept because if you design websites, you end up with you know three files um, the size of uh, 500 kilobytes or something. And you upload it to your server, and then you fix the thing uh, as long as it needs fixing. And with a, a web dis with a magazine, that uh, works a bit different. You know, you actually export a gigantic file. It ends up being four or five gigabytes. You upload it to your server, and then you find five more typos and three other issues, and then you do the same thing again, and you repeat that process about three weeks, uh, and then eventually you have to make a final call and send the uh, the URL to the download of that file to your printer, and uh, that was scary as hell. Um, and then my printer started, who's in Berlin, started working on the first issue. And they sent me these photos afterwards. Um, and so I was basically camping in front of my mailbox in, in Melbourne for four weeks, waiting for the magazine to arrive. Um, because it takes about two weeks to produce a magazine, maybe a couple more days to bind it, and then send it over. It takes another couple of, maybe a week or so. And then it finally arrived. And it really was a fuck yeah moment. <laughs> um, finally, after 10 years of sitting in front of a freaking computer screen, I could actually give my mom a copy and tell her, this is what I'm doing. Because the concept of web design still confuses old people. Um, but you know, there was this really cool moment when you, t when you unwrap it and you take it out, and it's, it's amazing. Like, it's exactly what I wanted to do. But then. Immedi almost immediately after that, you open it up and you see all the problems. Um, and I was reminded of a quote by an editor, um, who, her name is uh, Carolyn Wood, and she said to me when I first started with this thing, that um, you'll never see your own publication the same way that other people do. And I didn't really know what she meant at the time, but when I received my own copy of the magazine, my own magazine, I knew exactly what she meant because you look at your magazine, you see all the little faults, you see all the mistakes and all the, you know, the commas missing and the, the colors off and the photos not 100% perfect. You see all of these things, and it's really hard to see the good things about the magazine. And whoever, if, if you guys, if anyone here reads my blog, they will know that I've have all these um, issues with my work because I always see the problems and not the good things. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I was basically sitting on 3,000 copies of well, they were sitting in Berlin. I was in Melbourne, and uh, I had to sort of think about the way of dist distributing them or selling them. Um, of course, I thought about that while the magazine was in the making. Um, and the traditional way of selling magazines is basically uh, this: so you are the publisher is on one side, the the, the stockist or the, the retailer on the other side, and in between there is usually a distributor. And the, what the distributor does is basically takes and um, I'm not saying buying; he takes the magazine off you. Um, a certain amount of copies, and then tries to actually get as many copies into his network of shops 
uh, as possible. And um, the good thing is that you know everything is handled. You don't have to actually do anything. The bad thing is, first of all, they take a cut, 20%, which is, I guess, OK. Um, the problem, though, is that, uh, first of all, I contacted some of these distributors, and they sent me contracts via email. There were like 10, 12-page uh, Word documents. Uh, they were so outdated, like that some of them um, only paid me, could only pay me via check. Um, I don't, it's an American thing, I don't know. Um, and the, the other thing that really bothered me is that they take all these magazines off you, and if, they, if they're shops that they work with, if they only sell maybe 50 or 60% of those magazines, the rest is usually destroyed. And that really bothered me. First of all, it's a waste, you know, it's uh, environmentally a waste, but it's also a waste in terms of, you know, they're, they're my babies, I don't want them to be destroyed. Um, and so I decided to uh, do it myself, to self-distribute the magazine myself, and I magically <laughs> at 20%. Um, so maybe just to mention here, like the, the stockers and selling it through shops is actually not that important to me. I probably sell about 20%, 15 to 20% of, of magazines through shops. Everything else is sold through the website. And given that most of my audience is quite tech-savvy and quite switched on when it comes to the internet, um, I, uh, I you know, decided, obviously, that a, a website would be the best sales tool for the, for the magazine. And so I designed, this is the latest version, uh, I decide, decided to, to design a, a website that's responsive and you know, it's, it's, it's clear to use, easy to use. Um, and then I had to find a way to actually manage the sales myself. Um, so there's a lot of good, uh, great e-commerce packages, you know, uh, Shopify, Big Cartel, and there's a lot of open source software out there to manage um, online shops, and they're all great. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, the problem with uh, with a magazine, with a physical magazine subscription, is that um, it has to reprocess orders. And what I mean by that is that if you sell a subscription, in my case, uh, I sell three issues a year. If you buy three issues a year, um, you basically pre-purchase three issues. Um, so if you buy one today, you probably get the current issue sent to you, and then if the next two issues come out, I have to my system has to basically reprocess that order every single time a new issue comes out to see whether the issue you ordered is or whether the issue that came out is part of your order, and so um, that made it a bit tricky. And there was also some other requirements about um, how to actually print shipping labels and all that. And so I hired a developer friend of mine here in Melbourne who helped me develop this uh, this order management system that now runs in the background. And that allows me to, to manage my subscriptions easily. Um, it actually, uh, so I can actually change uh, yeah, uh, address details if someone moves in between issues. It actually uh, optimizes shipping costs so that if someone orders, uh, you know, few, three or four magazines, it'll decide what's cheaper, whether it's cheaper to send them in a, in a box or in, in separate envelopes, and so on. And one of the most important features of this thing is that it allows me to export orders in a certain format because I have to ship them. And since the magazine was printed in Berlin, I couldn't do it myself, right? So they were sitting in Berlin um, in a warehouse. Um, and when I started, to get a, uh, started getting quotes from shippers, I also looked into how I could possibly send the magazine from Germany without um, you know, spending too much money on, on having someone do it for me. Um, and I found this really great fulfillment company in Berlin. They're, they're awesome. They're quite small, so they're approachable, they're personal and they do everything for me now. So I have to uh, export a file every week um, with my th the system that I produce, send them the file, and they basically process all the orders, uh, put shipping labels on, 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 the, on these envelopes, and then put the magazines inside and send them off. And that was another really, I think, wise decision to actually have everything in Berlin. Even though it's it's nice to would be nice to go um, you know check in on things on production and uh, shipping every now and then, um, having everything in Berlin and having the prices uh, in Ber like the prices from Berlin uh, gives gives makes everything sustainable pretty much. Um, just to give you an idea, sending a magazine from Berlin to Melbourne cost me in postage maybe about five dollars. Sending it from Melbourne to Berlin, same distance, same packaging, everything would cost me about fifteen dollars. And someone's getting royally ripped off there. I don't know. <clears throat> and so that's it. You know, I'm pretty much um, I'm halfway through issue number eight. Um, issue number seven is uh, is done, and issue number eight is coming out in April. Every issue is still uh, a huge challenge. You know, there are days where I want to throw out everything, throw everything out the window, and become a, a chicken farmer. Um, so it's not all sunshine and roses, um, but over the last two and a half years, I've actually learned a lot 
about indie publishing and cr creating a print product. Um, so I want to quickly, um, running out of time, I quickly mention four things that I think are, are worth mentioning. Um, we hear all the time that you know print is dead, and um, why why would would I bother doing anything in print? Um, and it's true, print is dead for a lot of businesses that rely on the traditional uh, business model of advertising, you know, newspaper, mainstream magazines, that sort of thing. Um, but on the other side, um, independent publishing has quickly become a new art form. Um, some say that uh, indie, indie magazines will thrive in our attention economy because um, they don't demand immediate attention. So you buy a magazine and you, you slowly digest it, you know, you put it on your desk and it takes a while to get through it. And that's exact, that's not um, a bad thing, it's a good thing. And so as a result, there's never been more uh, indie, uh, niche-specific indie magazines on the market that, uh, ever before. So now you can buy a magazine about you know, booze or fixies or s sneakers or, or anything really. It seems like the passion and the community behind the magazine, that's the limit. Um, and it's great to know that this art form is not dying out, it's just sort of evolving. So magazines will become more and more of a niche, mag uh, niche market, uh, you know, specifically serving a certain community instead of trying to um, um, you know, reach a broad spectrum of people. <clears throat> um, producing real products comes with a lot of loose ends and every single time I produce a new issue is pretty much a new product and a new journey that you, you, you go on. Um, and so shipping real products around the world means that you spend a large amount of time apologizing for the inabilities of postal services to do their job right. Um, and as a result, I have a lot of respect for companies that ship things around the world and make real things, and in turn, I've lost all my respect for shipping companies. Um, there's a, a story about a box that I sent to uh, Florida from Berlin. It's supposed to take two weeks, it arrive five and a half weeks or so later. Uh, the guy emailed me and said, you know, I've received your box, it's got your labels, it's got your branding, everything on it, but there's no magazine inside. And instead, it had like papers on philosophy and ship it, uh, building ships. And we have no idea how they could have swapped the content without, you know, damaging the box. It's, it's a mystery. Uh, and that's the sort of shit you have to deal with when you ship real products. Um, I've you know, producing this whole thing, making off-screen has been uh, an experiment for me since day one. And uh, as I said before, I, I really struggled to find information and get people to open up and tell me what's happening and how I actually approach this thing. And so um, I decided to share pretty much everything, the whole process from, from nothing to issue seven so far on my blog. And I'm talking about everything. Like I open my books, you can see how much money I make on my blog. I talk about, you know, finding contributors, finding sponsors, working with... Uh, with the printer to find the best paper stock, all this stuff. Um, and as a result, I think I earned uh, a lot of respect and a lot of followers um, that then again turned into readers. And I think a lot of people now read the magazine, not just because of the content or because of the, 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 the product itself, but also because they feel like they're part of a, of a, of a, of a journey or part of a, of a story. And if they, I think if there's one thing that I'm most proud of, what I'm really proud of is sharing my story with um, you know, web for folks that are get now getting excited about receiving a magazine in the mail and creating that, that community around that brand. And finally, um, a few words on, on the sort of getting started. Um, I felt really intimidated when I, uh, you know, when I, when, I, when I started and I looked at the magazines that I had sitting on my shelf. I was intimidated by the quality of the magazines. I was intimidated by the publishers and people that I talked to, and I was intimidated by the amount of work that went into the magazine. Um, there was a fear of uh, financial failure, you know, sitting on a few thousand copies that nobody wants, um, but even greater than the fear of financial failure, I guess, is the fear of uh, creative failure, in which case I'd, sit, I'd be sitting on a few thousand copies that I don't want. Um, so our need for, for perfection is a massive source of anxiety. You know, you, you look at things and you want to get a that right, you want to get it perfect, you want to, you, want to, you, you measure yourself with the best of the best. And uh, that creates inertia, it sort of, you know, stops us from getting started. And so, if there's one lesson that I, I want to share, it's probably um, simply don't be too hard on yourself, you know. Um, if you try something new, you are destined to make mistakes, and making mistakes is, is good, that's the only way you learn, and Sharing your mistakes is even better because people will love you, not in spite of it, but because of it, because you're sharing mistakes. And remember, um, everybody is just faking it, faking it. In fact, I'm faking it right now. I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>
thanks for sticking around. We've got about five minutes for questions. If anyone has a question for Kai, anyone? Yeah. Excellent. Sure. Um, obviously, your the subject matter of the magazine is web design and all of that. But you've learned a whole lot of other skills since starting the magazine. Do you yourself still consider yourself to be a web designer? Um. Yeah. Sure. Um. I don't know. Um. <laughs> I've never really paid much attention to titles, um, but I never really, I was never really comfortable telling people I'm a web designer anyway. Um, I just play around on my computer and whatever comes out, I'll, I'll sell um, to people. But um, yeah, I think I, I, I still follow the web community um, closely enough. I think I'm more part of the web community than I am of the print community. So uh, all the followers that I had in the beginning when I first started the magazine are still my followers on Twitter and Facebook. And so I, I still follow that, that industry closely. I go to conferences and stuff even though I don't really do any work for clients anymore. Um, so yeah, by the way, off-screen is a full-time job now. Um, so yeah, I, I would say I'm still a web designer, even though I'm not a practicing web designer. I'm probably just following the, the industry and feel at home, I guess. Is it kind of, do you reckon it's kind of part of like being a web designer or something? Yeah, um, I think, and I think what I brought, in, what I brought with me into the, into the publishing uh, industry, I guess, is that sort of problem-solving skill that you look at something that doesn't work, um, like the the, opera, the auto management system that I that I showed you. Like you look at something, it doesn't work, or it seems to seem there seems to be a better way. And so you, you take that problem and you try to apply um, your way of, of solving it. Um, and I think that's very much ingrained into the web community, where you know you're constantly solving problems and finding better ways. So I guess yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> One more question? Oh, two more. Sorry. Anyone else? Oh, by the way, there's also uh, copies uh, for sale at the uh, registration desk if you guys want to um, grab a copy and, and support me. <laughs> um, yeah, any more questions? Otherwise, you can just email me. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see yourself as like a storyteller or a researcher or a documentarian? Um, yeah, maybe a researcher. Uh, I don't really tell stories. I, I, the only thing I write about the, uh, in the magazine really is the, edit the editor's note. So the stories to tell um, are up to the, the contributors I choose. So I guess um, it all depends on the, the research that I do before I publish a magazine. So I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm probably more of a researcher that finds the contributors and puts them all together in a, in a, in a, in a way that I think would inspire people. Yeah. Sure. Um, you commission all of the yeah. the That's a good, good question because I... Um, uh, there's always um, the, the question um, about you know whether you, it's sustainable because you, you don't pay someone or you do pay someone. Um, I, I pay certain people. Um, the thing is with a magazine, what's make, what makes Austrian sort of new, unique is that um, there's a lot of interviews in there. Uh, I don't pay people to actually uh, be interviewed. Um, there's a lot of things in there that I where I profile people, where I ask them, can you please tell me the story of your company or tell me the story of uh, you know your creative journey or whatever. I don't pay them either. Uh, what I do pay um, is if I have to hire photographers to get a certain shoot done. Um, however, with the interviews, most of the time, I ask them at the beginning, do you, want, do you have a colleague, a friend who wants to take photos because they feel more comfortable taking the photos with them? And nine out of 10 cases, they will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everyone works in the creative industry, most of the people in there. So I, I'd rather have my, my wife, my partner, my, my, my colleague sitting next to me take the photos because I feel more comfortable and then I, Either offer them a small token payment, or I say you know you can get a subscription for free or something like that. So I guess what makes off screen more easier, easier, sustainable than other magazines is the fact that uh, most of the content is actually first person content. It's written by them about them. Um, so paying every single person that, that actually produces something for the magazine would probably not make it sustainable. Yeah, good question. Cool. Thanks again for listening. Thanks very much.